Welcome to this short presentation. This is a, a presentation that's really a, a testament to uh, the work of Dr. Kohei Honda, Kohei Honda um, who was a dear friend. And it's a story of effective collaboration between industry and academia and the building of an enduring friendship. My name's Professor Steve Ross Talbot. So what does it mean to have effective collaboration? Well, really, it has to be elemental. We'll come to what that means in a minute. And there has to be a common cause, because without these, we can do nothing of significance. It needs time, and uh, it comes about from a juxtapositioning of the elemental nature of the individuals and the forging of a common cause. So let's have a look at what it means to be elemental. So elemental really is about being in your element, embracing your role. Um, and all good collaborations have great matching roles. So with Kohei, Kohei brought this massive enthusiasm for distributed computing and theoretical computer science. He brought a vision that was a wonderful vision um, that included precision and a huge amount of academic rigor so that when we did things, we knew exactly what the impact of those things were. And an entrepreneurial appreciation, understanding that uh, that that uh, how the benefits of this can actually be realized in a commercial setting. Whereas what I brought really was a similar enthusiasm, a similar vision, a love of precision and an academic appreciation. What I brought very much was the entrepreneurial aspects of this. And in many ways, I think we would both consider ourselves as two sides of the same coin. And that's one of the things that made the, the collaboration so effective over many years. So common cause, well, if you search for Kohei Honda on Google, um, you'll find a number of images, not all of which are Kohei. And one of the issues that we faced that's common cause was ambiguity. And we'll talk a little bit more about ambiguity, but let's have a look at some of the images. So here we've got an image. It's not of Kohei. It's obviously a samurai um, who brought um, honesty and uh, fighting qualities. And those qualities of honesty and, and the fighting qualities uh, very much are things that Kohei exhibited in his work uh, in furthering our understanding of distributed computer science. Um, uh, and equally, you know, he was a fighter. He could certainly, you know, fight in, in terms of constructing an argument and um, furthering that argument. And he had incredible poise and balance and precision that allowed those arguments to be understood by everybody because they were so finely, beautifully balanced. It was that precision and aesthetic qualities. And it, it, that precision was extended by, you know, this sort of robotic picture as a quality where um, he understood about um, the precision needed in order to automate things, which is really what we do in computer science. And, um, you know, he wasn't averse to uh, a verbal fist fight, but in the most wonderful way, never um, in, in, in a sort of brutal way. It was very elegant, perhaps a little different to this picture. So none of these are of Kohei. These are Kohei. Uh, uh, so on the um, on the bottom right, you've got Kohei in the sun, smiling way, and at the top, it's a working group meeting for the choreography working group within W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, with Nobuko Yoshida, his wife, uh, on the far right with her hair up, and Kohei leaning back with a slightly stripy jumper and his glasses on, and Charlton Barretto in the foreground. And that dominated, actually, the, the, the collaboration in the early days, because that's when Kohei got involved in the stuff we were doing. So removing ambiguity became our common cause because that ambiguity is the root cause of software defects. It reduces the aesthetic properties of systems and it can be downright dangerous. And here's a little sh short movie that illustrates how dangerous it can be. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät, das Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Yeah, hold on. We, we are sinking. We are sink... Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> So that's uh, an amusing anecdote that I used to share with Kohei, and it certainly made us laugh. I hope it made you laugh too. So let's take a journey back through time, because I want to examine the importance of Kohei's work. And we're going to do this by looking at a parallel industry, the automotive industry. So the first assembly line, Model T Ford in the early 1900s, um, uh, was a major, had a major impact on, on the global economy. And at that time, our ability to understand a model was really about the schematics we could draw up and the level of detail we could put in the schematics. 
and our ability to model and simulate things before we built them was simply not there. We built the prototype, the actual physical prototype, and drove it. So that was our understanding of modeling and simulation. However, you know, this first assembly line was a massive, massive change to the, the world economy. It was fueled by an innovation in process, which is kind of interesting because process algebra um, and session types, which is what Kohei um, uh, was an expert in, um, uh, have similar aspects to them in that uh, the process of creating an assembly line was really about understanding the different roles that people needed to play and where things could happen in parallel. So you can put the, the, the wheels on a car that's almost finished while somebody else is um, cr you know, creating the, uh, uh, the steering wheel. So you, know, you, you get this parallelization of tasks and that uh, enables you to have a much lower cost delivery model. Um, and that that's, uh, uh, starts to allow you to divide the labour up in a better way. And the business impact was not just lower cost, but commutability in the sense that prior to the Model T Ford, commuting distances were about 15 mile radius from where you lived. So the, the, the mobility of labour was not very good. But post the Model T Ford, that commutability went up to beyond 50 miles, which led to a mobility in the workforce that had a massive impact on the global economy, let alone the economy of the United States at the time. So that then got better as we learnt more. So the assembly line of, of Chrysler in the 1970s um, uh, meant that you could have um, uh, a, a better way of doing the same assembly line. You could have more roles, more concurrency, do things more efficiently. And the modelling simulation started to take on more significance as we built uh, not just prototypes but actual models and put tape on them and put them in wind tunnels to examine whether actually the chassis and the, the, the shape of the car was the most effective given the wind resistance. And that was really fueled by a deeper understanding of process and a continual improvement in that process driven by that understanding. And the business impact, not just black, not just one shape. Um, and far more efficient, so you could do more cars in the same time, you could do different shapes, different colours and so on and so forth. So things got better as we learnt more. And today, they got even better because the modern assembly line is dominated not by people who are placed on an assembly line, but by robotics. We now know so much about the process that we're able to automate it. And we're able to do the same with the modelling, it's now in silico, it's on a computer. And this really, whilst we had that understanding in the 70s, we didn't have the technology. So this innovation was really fueled by an advancing technology. So how to build robots and how to use um, uh, MIPS and cheaper memory. So as MIPS went up and memory prices came down, our ability to use this technology to automate went up. And the business impact, finer grain customer needs can be met massive cost reductions in the cost of doing cars, of actually building them, and, and quality improvements in the, in the result. So what this has got to do with software is simple. If we chart the progress of car manufacturing as an assembly line and software manufacturing as an assembly line, it starts to look, there's some very interesting parallels. So the Model T Ford assembly line and the software manufacturing assembly line, the waterfall life cycle, um, have similar properties in that you know it was really fueled by this understanding in process. We were able to understand the roles people play: systems analysts, business analysts, software engineers, software designers, and so on, and even testers. Um, and that got continually improved, just as the Chrysler plant did in the 70s. So we continually improved our ability to place people in the software assembly line, whether we were using the V model or the agile development methodology, still dominated by people with not a huge amount of automation to change that. Um, but you know, certainly massive improvements with you know, greater parallelism and our ability to execute projects ge generally getting much better. Um, but now contrast that with the robotics age um, of the modern day um, car manufacturing plant. So this is what really Kohei has given us. The technology, like robotics, MIPS and memory, in this case Pi Calculus, Session Type, CDL and Scribble, to automate parts of the software development lifecycle that hitherto were not possible to automate. And this is um, never more um, obvious than in the Zero Deviation Lifecycle platform that um, Kohei has helped us develop within 
um, my new business um, that's that's uh, um, within Cognizant Technology Solutions. So we're able to automate things that just simply were not possible to automate before and do it with a surety because we fully understand from a theoretical perspective what it is we're doing and how it is we go about solving those problems. When you look at the progress from Petri to Milner's Turing Prize in 91, and we were lucky, both Kohei and I, to work with Robin for a long time as well. Kohei brought session types to the world in 93 with Vasco Vasconcelos, and he got involved in 2004 with the Choreography Working Group, which is what, when the collaboration really started. And the formal underpinnings of that work came out in 2005 with a paper on the global calculus that was a, a collective paper with Robin Milner, Kohei Honda, Nobuko Yoshida, Marco Caboni and, and Dr. Gary Brown and myself. And that real formal underpinnings really allowed us to build the first technology stack with the development of the Pi for Soa open source established late in 2005 that directly took the work of the formal underpinnings. And that then gave rise um, towards the end of 2005 to the notion of testable integration architecture where we can test a, uh, an architecture which is just a session type really um, against a set of instances which are requirements to see whether those um, instances are met by the type um, and therefore the solution meets the requirements. The development of Scribble in 2007, son of CDL, took all the work we did in CDL and um, recast it in a better way and the establishment of the joint Savara project between Red Hat and Cognizant and, and um, Kohei and various other academics throughout the world um, was a significant advancement on the Pi for Soa open source in 2005. Our ability then to do root cause analysis of complex defects was really all about our ability to understand whether a session instance is a member of a session type and if it isn't, why isn't it? And it's the why it isn't that is the automatable part of root cause analysis that we were able to achieve in 2010 and that we use to this day. The establishment of the zero deviation lifecycle platform in 2011 was directly related to all of all of that stuff that preceded it and our ability to migrate one technology stack to another um, in a very sure way, smart technology migration in 2012 was another testament to the work of session types. And that ends to, uh, well, continues really, but the, the, the last item really is the OVM analyst report, which talks about the ZDLC and the importance of the ZDLC. So that's, that's the important, that's the progress we made. The importance, which was the, uh, the look at the assembly line. I would say that the automation that the ZDLC is giving us um, based on session types, very much so, is as important to the world today as the Model T Ford assembly line was in, in, in the 1900s. We're only at the beginning of this journey of automation and we expect to see much, much more and the work continues. So I'd like to just say a thank you to Kohei for all the work that he's done uh, in, the, in the past and without him we would never be where we are today. So thank you Kohei.